Thank you very much for joining us for the Society of Thoracic Surgeons video roundtable discussion on appropriate use of robotics in general thoracic surgery. It is also part of the STS Surgical Hot Topics podcast. I'm really excited uh, today because we have an excellent panel of thought leaders in robotics internationally in general thoracic surgery. We're all going to introduce ourselves in a second. Uh, but robotics is really part of that new industrial revolution, the sort of fourth industrial revolution. As Michael Mack says, in surgery we're moving smaller, faster, easier. And robotics definitely fits that rubric. I'm Dr. David Cook. I'm head of general thoracic surgery at UC Davis. And we're going to go around a table and introduce our experts. I'm Robert Merritt. I'm the director of thoracic surgery at The Ohio State University. Lana Schumacher, the director of robotic thoracic surgery at Massachusetts General Hospital. Melanie Edwards, I'm a thoracic surgeon at St. Joe's Mercy Ann Arbor. Indra Paul Sarkaria, I'm the uh, vice chairman of thoracic surgery at University of Pittsburgh. Great. So welcome today, everyone. So I'll first start off with the question, is robotics appropriate for all types of cases? Are there cases that are too difficult for robotics? Or are there cases that are too easy for robotics? Robert, maybe we could start with you. Sure, I think uh, any time that we decide to implement robotic technology, uh, we should be very mindful of costs. Uh, I think in cases of you know, simple, straightforward cases, such as a wedge resection for a lung biopsy, uh, you know, I think using robotics is probably not the best option. Uh, but I think it's certainly appropriate uh, for lobectomy and other complex pulmonary resections. In terms of the limitations, I think that's a relative uh, decision, uh, depending on the expertise and experience of the surgeon. I think the, the applicability really depends on, on the experience of the surgeon. Lana, you want to come? Yeah, I agree. I think that in, we were discussing the learning curve of this, and you might want to pick the more straightforward cases, and as if you've done and past your learning curve and as you gain more experience you can take on the more challenging ones and a lot of times you may think okay I can't do this one I'll have to convert but we'll, well, let's just start and try you'll be pleasantly surprised so complicated cases can definitely still be done robotic. Mm -hmm. I agree I think it's up to every surgeon to determine what their capability is what their comfort level is to always keep in mind patient safety first costs are important but patient safety primarily and to just organically go through the process. You know, there's no prize for doing or completing a case robotically. There's a great uh, benefit to getting a patient safely through an operation with a good quality operation, whatever means that happens to be. I do think the technology, I agree with the other panel members, is outstanding for complex procedures, but you have to get there on your own time scale and your own learning curve. Melanie, we, we, we talk <coughs> about um, getting ourselves on the learning curve uh, for robotics. And then um, uh, also, of course, the trainee on the learning curve. But what about the staff? Our, our operating room nurses, our operating room circulators, our anesthesiologists who are also on a learning curve for robotics. Is there room for some simple cases to help train the staff as opposed to ourselves? I think that's a great point. I think that when you're building a robotic program, I think volume and consistency are very important to um, quality and patient outcomes. So getting your entire team familiar with the setup of the case, the conduct of the case, um, getting your anesthesiologist comfortable with the anesthetic and also having everyone prepared with a plan in place for how to deal with emergencies is a critical part of this. And you can't train a team, you can't be ready for the big cases if you're not versed in the simple cases. So there may be a role for some of the more simple cases early on just to get your team familiar with the setup and the process of going through that and then you can maybe shift away as you're more comfortable with the more complex cases. But definitely having a team um, approach to this is critical and if your administration doesn't see the value of it, I think patient safety and outcomes are should be the number one priority and that's one way to assure that. So small easy wins for the team. Uh, boost the morale of the team, yeah. and that should lead to the, the facility of more complicated cases. Absolutely. So sp speaking of complicated cases, uh, Lana, um, is there a 
uh, type of case that you thought there's no way I could do this minimally invasively and then with robotics it allowed you to do so? Yes, definitely things where now we're looking at pneumonectomy, sleeve resections, reconstructions. And in my, uh, earlier on in my practice, I would tell myself, well, you know, the patients may ask for it and, and I've had that situation where they have. And I said, as long as we can safely proceed, you know, we will do it. But if I feel at any point that there is any concern about that, then we'll convert. And I've been pleasantly surprised because I think that even with larger central tumors, obstructing views that you normally can't see as well, even open that you have <laughs> the advantage of being able to see underneath and doing the dissection safely just because of the magnification of your view, the angles of your instruments. And so it, it, I've been pleasantly surprised more often than not. Interval? I agree. I think that uh, as you go through, you approach a case with an open mind and proceed safely. I think mediastinal tumors, uh, more complex mediastinal tumors that we're seeing that may have even more extensive involvement of other structures, pericardium certainly, and potentially even vein, but these are again not ones to tackle off, off the bat. But as your experience increases, you can think outside the box and, and attempt to do these uh, minimally invasive as long as we're within reasonable realm of safety. Esophagectomy certainly uh, that many of us perform here uh, is a fantastic operation, but another operation that just takes time to get through that learning curve and doing those early cases, the simpler cases, to get the facility in your hands, the muscle memory and, and all the other things that come with just learning technology and an instrument uh, certainly will benefit you. Robert, do you think your percentage of minimally invasive cases have increased because of robotics or maybe you've just transitioned minimally invasive bats or laparoscopic to robotics? Is there a net gain? Yeah, I think in my practice it's the latter. Uh, I was a bat surgeon before I started doing robotic surgery. And I found that in my practice, it was more of a seamless transition uh, because I was doing most of my lobectomies uh, thoracoscopically. Uh, so I was doing minimally invasive surgery, but I just made the simple transition from you know, VATS to robotic uh, lobectomy. And I think it was more of a seamless you know, transition because I had already committed to doing minimally invasive surgery for early stage lung cancers. And robotics was kind of a natural you know, progression and transition. Mm -hmm. So I found it easier in my practice to make the transition. Mm -hmm. uh, Melanie, um, you know, as you know, as we all know, uh, value equals outcomes over cost. And value to the patient follows that ratio. Um, um, what, if, what would you say to the person that it just doesn't make common sense that robotics fits into that value equation? I think that's a great question and I think that's the ongoing debate with robotic surgery because the technology is more expensive up front and so I think value comes in two forms. I think there's the immediate uh, cost savings that you can um, acquire by getting patients out of the hospital faster and lowering their pain relative to an open approach. Whether or not we can argue f versus bats versus robotics I think remains to be seen, but I think a minimally invasive approach is very important in obtaining that value for the patients both in the short term and then there's the long term value for the patient um, in kind of intermediate to long term in terms of their return to function, their um, pain scores as we're looking at opioid use generally, anything that we can do to decrease that burden on the patient is important. Lastly, for older patients for whom um, you know, surgery may not be offered or for whom they may be reticent to undergo, say, an open thoracotomy, being able to offer a lo uh, robotic lobectomy in the octogenarians, um, you know, there's data that surgery and lobectomy is more beneficial to older patients even than stereotactic radiosurgery. I think this offers them that advantage. So um, I think the value needs to be taken in a greater context. Mm -hmm. Interval, so there's been reports that uh, with robotic surgery, length of stay is shorter. Do you think that, length, that shortening of length of stay is related to the actual technology or perhaps as we are instituting or integrating this expensive technology, we are more aware of what keeps people in the hospital? Yeah, I think that's a fantastic question. My sense, and I'd love to hear what the other panelists have to say as well, is that we are getting better at taking care of patients and more efficient at identifying the key factors that hold somebody in the hospital, the barriers to discharge, the barriers to recovery. 
I, I suggest that most of us who are doing robotics are already sort of on that forward thinking spectrum and thinking a little bit more holistically about the entire patient journey. So speaking to costs and value, uh, we are very attuned to that in general. Not that others aren't, but it has to, it's been a force necessity when we are thinking about these costs of these, these systems to see where we can add that value or that quality back by decreasing the costs while maintaining quality. Uh, and just a quick comment then to also, you know, the value that, that Melanie was talking about. Um, yeah, it's hard to quantify all that, even, that's the, even though that is the basic equation that we go back to. How do we quantify the value of losing a surgeon 10 years early because they have carpal tunnel, lower back pain, cervical stenosis? And these are things we don't think about too much. Are these technologies prolonging our careers, causing less workplace injuries? That's a very hard value to, I think, quantify, and they may be something that can enter the discussion at some point as we really try to look at the value of these, these types of platforms as well. So value, outcomes <coughs> over cost, um, uh, repetitive injury uh, to surgeons. Uh, so, you know, we are uh, high-level athletes to some degree. Um, Lana, you are a, a uh, robotics director uh, at a very long-standing traditional program. How do you incorporate these concepts uh, as you generate your practice as well as train the next generation of, of surgeons? It is changing the paradigm for sure. And I think lots of education and repetition about talking about it is okay that the patients go home in a day, you know, after a lobectomy if they're ready. And, and just talking to your patients about that, talking to your partners about it. Um, I've experienced it. Everyone has a lot of interest, um, but they're, I think, cautionary interest, right? They're, they're cautious about just jumping into it. But I think that we have seen and data has shown that these patients are, are doing well with good outcomes um, and it's safe and that we can do, again, more challenging cases it, very safely um, with the technology. So, so far, there's been very good adoption, uh, but I think education uh, on all fronts, um, the team education, you're educating your partners, educating the patients, um, educating the nursing staff in the hospital, all of these things come together. And I think also implementing the ERAS protocols as well, which we don't have it, we will also, I think all those will contribute to changing paradigm. Hmm. Robert, so you didn't learn robotics in training, correct? Correct. Uh, yet you do extremely complex surgery uh, safely mm -hmm. uh, with good outcomes. Mm -hmm. How is that a, a, a dream or how is that, how is that possible? How do you learn, teach yourself this complex tool uh, and maintain patient safety? Yeah, that's a very good question. I, I think it, it uh, requires a commitment to learning the new technology. Uh, it's almost like you're going through another you know, residency again. Uh, you have the basis in anatomy and how to do a fundamental operation. And now you're trying to apply a new technology to doing the same operation. And that requires, you know, you have to retrain yourself. So you have to uh, go through the sort of standard, you know, robotic training. You have to reach out to some of the experts in the field. Uh, I went to watch other expert robotic surgeons do operations and see how they do it and take that back to my institution. Start with low level cases that are very simple, straightforward, and then slowly progress to the more complicated cases. And I think that's the best way to kind of, you know, educate yourself and to get to that point where you can do the more complex cases with the new technology. So Melanie, should that be protocolized? Should, should this be, is that an innovation in and of itself, a, an actual curriculum to take you from point A to point B? I think so, because right now there are not standard um, curricula or criteria for in the introduction, and unfortunately, um, it is a challenge for people who are already in practice. Um, fortunately, through the TSF and WTS, there are also opportunities to spend even more time that can be partially funded um, with robotic experts to kind of move yourself along that learning curve. So that's what I did. I um, applied for one of the WTS scholarships and was able to take, you know, three weeks, spend it with a very busy robotic surgeon, and um, get some really hands-on experience that I think really helped accelerate my 
confidence so that I could go back and really jump into doing um, a lot of the more complex cases probably earlier than I would have otherwise. But a definite curriculum and I think broadening the base of surgical mentors who are accessible is also going to be an important uh, factor. Great. So in closing, perhaps maybe we could each talk about what we would like to see in technology, in robotics. What can help us help our patients? Well, there's any number of, I think, advances and additional technological, uh, I guess, uh, for lack of a better term, you know, widgets that we would love to see added to these programs. I think for me, a lot of it's going to come down to imaging and the advances in imaging technology, whether it be overlay, co-registration of anatomic structures we can't otherwise see with the naked eye. Uh, and there's so many layers to that technology. I think it's, it's really going to be fascinating to see where that goes. We're going to be seeing far more than we do with just natural light. I think um, the addition of, say, haptic feedback is, is one thing that we're lacking. Um, also, I would um, say in simulation, there, there's a, a ways to go in terms of being able to um, simulate cases, maybe simulate some of the more complex cases um, in a mock environment before going out into the uh, real environment. Robert? I agree uh, with Interpol. I'd like to see better interoperative uh, imaging. Uh, anything that can augment visualization of anatomy, uh, variations in anatomy, anything that can make the operation safer. And I think interoperative imaging would uh, certainly help in that area. Wow. And I agree with uh, Melanie with the haptic feedback. I think that's the, one of the more challenging aspects of uh, one in training, uh, that your eye has to learn that uh, tension and uh, be able to see those visual cues and that takes a fair number of cases before that's trained so we think if that technology can advance that would be a definite win for the field also I think that if we can figure out better even remote proctoring or being able to tell a mentor adding that to someone in their learning curve or even a new case or a more challenging case that you might need but that you don't have colleagues right around you and you want, want to reach out to someone, how do we make that uh, interaction and that telementoring process easier and more accessible? I agree with, with everything you all said. Um, uh, I want to double down on the, the telerobotics. I think the, the, the beginnings of robotic surgery began and with the, the concept of telerobotics, someone operating the console at point A and the surgery being done at point B, I take care of a large rural population. And this is an example of, of potentially uh, dissemination of, of this valuable technology where I, as a high volume robotic surgeon, can operate in one area and my partner uh, or colleague who is a, a rural surgeon, a very good open surgeon, perhaps at the bedside um, with the robot uh, and the instruments and assisting in a safe manner. So there will always be someone there who can convert to open, um, but the, the complex skill set doesn't have to necessarily be there. Well, thank you all of you very much. It's, it's uh, an honor to be surrounded by such uh, international experts in robotic uh, surgery and uh, provide uh, such great information and uh, for this uh, Society of Thoracic Surgeons video roundtable. And thank you to all of you. Thank you. Thank you.